All right. Uh, thank you. I'd like to call this meeting of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources to order. Uh, Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Anderson? Present. Assemblywoman Black? Here. Assemblywoman Brown May? Here. Assemblywoman Carlton? Here. Assemblywoman Cohen? Here. Assemblyman Ellison? Present. Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Here. Assemblywoman Hansen? Here. Assemblywoman Martinez? Present. Assemblywoman Titus? Here. Assemblyman Wheeler? Here. Chair Watts? I am here, thank you. We have all members present, we have a quorum. Uh, today we have one presentation and two bill hearings on our agenda for the uh, first water-focused uh, natural resources meeting of the session. Before we begin, I'll run through a couple of quick housekeeping announcements as I usually do. Members of the public can participate in our meetings in a variety of ways. Information on how to do so can be found on every meeting agenda for this committee as well as the Nevada Legislature's website. You can find additional details on the help page, which can be located from a header at the top of every page on our website. Participants must register uh, in advance and can submit opinion polls or sign up to testify uh, via phone. Written comments can also be emailed to our committee email before, during, or up to 48 hours after the meeting. Committee exhibits or amendments have to be submitted electronically in PDF form to our committee manager no later than 4 p.m. the business day prior to our meeting. Any amendments must include bill number, statement of intent, and contact information. All exhibits that are submitted can be found on the Nevada Legislature's website, where you can also sign up for personalized legislative tracking. Uh, we'll ask that all public comments and testimony be kept to two minutes so that speakers can be accommodated and we can get through the agenda in a timely manner. Um, speakers are urged to avoid repetition of comments made by previous speakers. It's completely fine to say, I agree with the previous statements, me too, ditto, et cetera. Uh, so with that, uh, we will go ahead and get into our agenda. I'll also just let uh, members uh, on the committee and members of the public know we are gonna take our bills out of order today. We are gonna hear Assembly Bill 6 first and then Assembly Bill 5. But uh, before we do that, we're gonna start with a presentation from the Division of Water Resources. Since they'll be presenting the bills, I just wanna uh, remind members to uh, make sure that you keep questions uh, focused on the, the issues on the presentation, and then we'll have questions on the bills as they are presented so that we can get through the agenda in a in an efficient manner. So with that, um, we'll, uh, our presenters from the division, please go ahead and introduce yourself. For the record, you may proceed whenever you are ready. Yes, good afternoon. This is Adam Sullivan. I am the acting Nevada State Engineer, which serves as the principal administrator of the Division of Water Resources. And I have a, a PowerPoint, which I am setting up. Got it. Okay, I got it. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Watts and members of the committee. Again, my name is Adam Sullivan. I am the acting Nevada State Engineer, and uh, which serves as the principal administrator of the Division of Water Resources. And I'm pleased to be here this afternoon to discuss some of the primary water resource management challenges that are facing our state. In today's presentation, I will start with an overview of the Division of Water Resources. Um, I will have some general statewide statistics on water supply and water use today. I will provide some updates on recent accomplishments following the 2019 legislative session 
And then I'll focus on some of the long-term challenges for the future of water management in Nevada. So the mission of the Division of Water Resources is to conserve, protect, manage, and enhance the state's water resources for Nevada's citizens through the appropriation and reallocation of the public waters. All waters belong to the public. A water right to divert and beneficially use the public resource can be obtained and held as a property right, and a water right can also be lost through non-use. Nevada water law was established early in the 20th century, and while there have been additions and clarifications since then, the core procedures and intent have not changed much since 1913 for appropriation and adjudication, and since 1939 for groundwater. This is a more thorough list of what we do on a daily basis. We appropriate and manage the use of Nevada's waters through water rights administration, with the exception of the Colorado River, which is overseen by the Colorado River Commission and managed by the Southern Nevada Water Authority to serve municipal water for its seven member agencies. We adjudicate claims of pre-statutory vested right and federal reserve water right claims we manage the distribution and the regulation of state decreed water rights. And by that, I mean that our staff open and close head gates for irrigation purposes in accordance with rotation schedules and priority dates. We are in the process of updating a state water plan and drought response plan in cooperation with others. And I will talk about this more later. We regulate well drilling and the licensing of well drillers we administer Nevada's dam safety program and the floodplain management programs at a state level in coordination with federal guidance and local partners. We also regulate aquifer storage and recovery projects, effluent reuse. We compile and collect water level data and water use data statewide and make that publicly available. We review subdivision plans for long-term water security and we review water conservation plans for small communities. This is a figure that shows a summary of statewide surface water use. So as you can see, about two thirds of our surface water is used for irrigation, which is typical for Western states. About 15% is used for municipal supply and about 19% is used for what I'm showing here is wildlife and recreation as non-diversion uses. And what that represents is the evaporation of water off lakes and um, open water bodies that are represented by water rights. So the average annual total surface water usage is approximately four to five million acre feet annually, depending on the year. And to put that into some visual context, the, the total storage volume in Lake Mead right now at its very low level is about 10 million acre feet. So here's another diagram that's showing the same data for groundwater use. And there's a similar pattern. About two thirds of groundwater is used for irrigation purposes. About 10% is used for, for municipal supply and about 10% for mining and lesser amounts for other manners of use. Just about 2% of groundwater use is uh, used by domestic wells that are exempt from the requirement to obtain a water right. And statewide groundwater use is approximately one and a half million acre feet annually. So about a third of our groundwater supply is from groundwater resources and about two thirds of our supply is from surface water resources. So this figure shows a comparison be between basin scale groundwater commitments and the long-term groundwater supply or the perennial yield. Groundwater rights are administered on a, on, a, on a basin scale. So there's 256 delineated topographic basins within the state and each one has a, an estimated water budget. And what this shows is that for every basin that is, that is colored in, the appropriations the commitments to groundwater within those basins exceeds what's estimated as the long-term average annual water budget, with the, the darker colors showing where that is more 
relatively more out of balance. So I do need to note here that there are a couple of areas that I, that I noticed when reviewing this map this morning that are actually not up to date as of the date shown on the map. Um, and so I need to correct that, but it still gives a good visual overview uh, and a good approximation of where, where we stand. And it's also really important to note that although this is a valid and, and useful metric for displaying this data, it doesn't necessarily show where the problems or the conflicts are. And each basin has different hydrologic conditions or actual water use or local groundwater management programs that are important components of the overall condition of the basin. And the, so the history of how basins became overappropriated and how they vary um, um, and what the circumstances are also makes it, you know, it makes addressing this issue, um, um, it's important to put all that into context beyond just what is shown on this figure. So before I discuss more on, on that topic, I want to go back and provide an update on uh, 2019 legislative initiatives. There were a handful of bills that passed in 2019 that are related to our, our division and are worth providing an update. So AB 62 directed the state engineer to develop regulations to address extensions of time for proving up on a water right. This is, this is an important issue because the statutory guidance for approving extensions is very brief and we have a large number of unperfected water rights that were initiated decades ago and continue to be extended. So in response to AB 62, we developed draft regulations. We held workshops last June and this January, and we have another workshop planned for this summer. These regulations affect a lot of people. And so with remote access, we need to be as accommodating as we can uh, to provide opportunity for public comment. Uh, and the public hearing is tentatively planned for this fall of 2021. Secondly, SB 140 established a 10% groundwater reserve for all basins that are not fully appropriated. So I should have mentioned that, maybe I can go back on this previous slide, all those basins that are unshaded, that don't have a number, are those basins where the perennial yield exceeds the current commitments. So the directive of SB 140 was to set aside 10% of the available groundwater um, that was not available for use. So this amount was calculated by our staff and enacted under interim order 1308. The final amount of the groundwater reserve is subject to determination of all commitments under pending applications and vested claims. But for now, order 1308 is in full effect to meet the intent of SB 140. SB 150 requires local governments to develop water resource plans and update them every 10 years. The Division of Water Resources serves as a cooperator and as a resource in the development of these plans, but they really are locally developed plans specific to those areas. Uh, DWR can, can still help in some ways, for instance, by sharing a common baseline of data for regional water budgets or by providing a record of valid water right commitments within, within the area of each uh, resource plan. And lastly is the creation of the water planning and drought resiliency section within our agency. And I have the next slide to further discuss this development. So this is now a statewide program within DWR focused on water conservation, drought response, long-term flood management, and long-range planning in cooperation with local water planning efforts. The state has authority under NRS Chapter 540 for water planning measures, but it's critical here that these efforts are in cooperation with local water authorities or boards or counties who have a shared interest in water planning and water security. For instance, our large municipalities have very effective and forward-looking water planning programs, and the objective here is to be complementary to existing programs. What our small staff can do is 
provided in these bullet points. We can offer review and technical assistance for water conservation plans and water resource plans that are developed by local communities by providing a common hub for data and methods of analysis. Secondly, our staff are working on a state water plan in cooperation with others and building on existing work that's been done in Nevada and in, in our sister states. The intent is to have a functional living document that is data-based and addresses current needs for Nevada. And for drought response and planning, our staff are cooperating with others to share data, communicate the science, and provide resources to help prevent the worst impacts of drought. The data are clear that we're experiencing increasing temperatures across the state. Climate models consistently forecast that we will continue to see greater extremes in drought periods and flood intensity. What this means for us is a longer growing season and a corresponding higher water demand for crops, more precipitation falling as rain rather than snow, an earlier peak runoff in the spring, and greater late season stress with more reliance on groundwater supplies. There's no easy path for how to be adaptive and resilient to these trends, but we can say that the greatest short-term impacts are, are to our agricultural regions where reliable water supply on an annual basis is important for crops and the local economy. The large municipalities are less immediately at risk because they have an extensive water planning effort in place and also managed storage reserves. Our water planning section will be incorporating the state of the science into the state water plan to help understand the long-term effects on water supply for Nevada. And there's also a really good compilation of data and um, the impacts to Nevada within the state climate initiative that is produced by the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Increased development and competing demands put pressure on our water security across the state. As we grow and diversify, water demands evolve and generally increase, but the supply is limited. This inherently creates conflict and our water law has limited tools for how to manage it. We are a prior appropriation state, which clearly establishes that senior uses that were established prior in time and that have continually used water have priority to access that supply of water. If there's not enough to go around, then those junior in time are not served. There's not much flexibility in balancing interests, needs, and uses from a state water law point of view. When I refer to conflict, what I'm talking about is, is the assertion that the use of water by junior water right holders is inhibiting access to that water by senior water right holders. With a limited supply of water, conflict does arise. Managing conflict can be complex due to a number of different variables. A large part of what makes managing conflict or potential conflict difficult is reconciling the strict prior appropriation doctrine with the dynamic nature of hydrogeologic systems and the effects of drought, where it's difficult to delineate exactly what constitutes a conflict and how to resolve it. Predicting, measuring, and resolving any potential conflict is difficult to pinpoint. Conjunctive management here refers to the common management of groundwater and surface water sources that are connected particularly where there is a hydraulic connection between a well and a stream or a spring source. Conjunctive management was added into statute in 2017 as a policy of the state. And it has some really challenging implications because historically groundwater and surface water rights have been administered independently. To address this, we are making a concerted effort to increase the amount of outreach and local engagement so we can develop a common understanding of the issues in different parts of the state, what the limitations are, and then how as a state agency, we can help with a pragmatic and equitable solution to local problems that work for that local area and still abide by state water law. For our division with a relatively small staff and a high volume workload, 
It's essential that we maintain regular and wide reaching field work duties to be in touch with the water users, collect and maintain good data and continue to be a resource oriented public service agency that's helping people navigate water law. This helps build trust and facilitate conflict resolution. And to the last point on this slide, reduces the tendency to create winners and losers. Statutory tools that are meant to facilitate the administration of water law are not always easy to implement. Under the basic tenets of prior appropriation, water rights that go unused for a long period of time can be lost either through cancellation forfeiture or abandonment. In practice, there's a high threshold for implementing this because for one, water rights have protections as a property right. And secondly, when forfeiture or cancellation is challenged or appealed, courts are reluctant to uphold these actions. It's common that a court will find that the state engineer followed the law. However, by reasoning of equity or compassion for circumstances often overrides the statutory requirements and reverses the state engineer action. The consequences of, of this is that we have a compounding challenge, particularly in over appropriated basins, where there are a lot of unused water rights on the books, but the primary statutory tools to get the basin back into balance are difficult to implement. The AB 62 regulations that I previously mentioned from 2019 on, on uh, extensions of time will really help provide consistency and guidance for our division in this regard, but it remains a, a statewide challenge. The second topic on this slide is protection of non-permitted uses. Water for environmental needs, such as springs and stream flow that support aquatic habitat or sub-irrigated meadows or wetlands, is a common concern because those resources don't have the same explicit protections against conflict that are afforded to other water right holders. In fact, there are a number of ways that environmental resources are protected. This might occur by protection of senior rights on a water source, which also protects the environmental value. It may occur through water right acquisition, for instance, for wildlife purposes, or through statutory protections for wildlife access to spring sources, or in the case of interbasin transfers, uh, which must be shown to be environmentally sound to be approved. The state engineer is also required to consider the public interest in making decisions to approve or deny a water right application. And although that definition and interpretation has evolved over generations, the public interest too can be a basis for protecting environmental water resources. Secondly, domestic wells are exempt from the need to acquire and maintain a water right, and they have a protectable interest as the supply of drinking water for homes but they also have a priority of the date the well was drilled and they tap into the same shared groundwater supply as other water righted wells. So in a basin with a limited groundwater supply and a proliferation of domestic wells, this can create problems and potential conflict and it, as well as confusion about the independence of domestic wells from overall state water management. There are two recent positive developments in this regard. First, the 2019 legislature established that domestic wells would still be allowed to pump a reduced amount of water in the event of curtailment in order to protect drinking water supply. And secondly, the Nevada Supreme Court recently provided some clarity of the state's role and authority in balancing the protectable interest in a domestic well with the need to address over appropriation at the basin scale. So this was for the Pahrump area in a decision that was just issued last week, but it will really help provide guidance for our division uh, for other parts of the state well into the future. The Pahrump case is, is one example of a clear directive from the Supreme Court on water law administration, but it's also very common that judicial review of water cases results in disparate and inconsistent decisions that impose administrative and regulatory challenges for us. Often judicial decisions are focused on the interest of the appealing party, which is understandable. But the challenge here is that the state engineer when making a decision must consider the implications on the entire basin, 
or the regional flow system or the entire state. And to have a range of judicial decisions for site-specific issues builds a set of contradictory precedents that make it difficult for the state to administer water law consistently and defensively. Here are some key resources that our division is working towards and will, and will need to continue to serve the public and the water resource into the future. First, water right appropriations are made based on a determination of whether there is unappropriated water available. And the state engineer has for decades relied upon USGS studies, that's the US Geological Survey, of water budgets um, at, at a basin scale to determine the perennial yield, which is the primary measure used to determine water availability. So this baseline science is increasingly is being challenged because the original studies are 50 to 70 years old. It's still good science and often is proven to be really accurate despite the limited data available at the time that the work was done. But today we do have a lot more data and computing power to conduct more accurate and up-to-date analyses of water budgets and either verify or amend the older studies. We need this for our decisions to be accurate and defensible, especially in the face of increasing demand for water. Some of this work is already ongoing in a gradual manner um, where, it's, where it's in need at a, at a local scale, but to do it thoroughly and statewide will take many years and will require a substantial investment. Secondly, modernizing our records by digitizing is needed to preserve historic documents, to enhance the ability to research these records, and to make good use of the limited space that we have available for, for document storage. We've come a long way in the last few years to provide basic water right information and mapping through our website, but a lot of the supplemental historic records are only available on paper for someone to come into our office to review. And we're continually adding to the record of water rights decisions as time goes on. Again, our staff need access to all of the history to fully research different issues and be able to cross-reference different documents and the public records need to be accessible to the public. So digitization and improving our web-based service will be a continuing need for us going forward. And with that, I'd like to conclude and I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan, for the presentation. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Uh, of course, this is a complicated area um, with a lot of different moving policy pieces and a lot of conflicts so appreciate you giving uh, as brief of an overview as is possible on uh, uh, water law related issues to the members of the committee we do have a few questions and uh, first off i will start with assemblywoman anderson thank you mr chair and thank you mr sullivan for the presentation uh, I trying to wrap my head around a whole bunch of different areas. So got a lot of things that I might actually just be contacting you about as well that to get some more clarification about later. Uh, but this question has to do with slide number six in a way. Um, basically the, the the hot zones or red zones that you brought up was very, it helped my visual brain uh, understand some parts. But for the appropriations for mining activities, um, how are those handled? Uh, I guess what I'm kind of ask, asking is how are the basin, are the basins being over appropriated based upon that mining activities or based upon other elements? Thank you, Assemblywoman Anderson for the question. This mm -hmm. is out of, I, thank you, Assemblywoman Anderson for the question. This is Adam Sullivan for the record. Um, for a point of clarity, are you referring to mine operations or are you talking about the question of groundwater mining? Thank you, uh, mining operations. Although if you feel like it, bring in one more element to make it a really nice long answer. By the way, that was a joke. Um, really, I was thinking about the mine operations themselves. 
Okay, thanks for the question. Again, Adam Sullivan for the record. Mine operations are subject to the same statutory requirements as any other manner of use throughout the state. Um, in some cases, mines that operate by dewatering re-inject that water back into the aquifer. And oftentimes the, the water rights are conditioned on a requirement to re-inject that the volume of water and um, only consumptively use a fraction of what's what's pumped. And mining operations, especially the larger ones, are um, regularly conduct annual updates with our agency to discuss their operations and their and their water requirements, their monitoring plans, and the results of their forecasted um, effects on on the water resource surrounding the operations area. With regard to the second question on groundwater mining, as a general rule, that is, is something that by having a perennial yield standard, um, we, as the state, Nevada is, um, we're, we're fortunate that that was, that um, the, the criteria of water availability was established early on in our history. We have one of the oldest groundwater laws among Western states. And so um, it, it goes a long ways towards preventing groundwater mining and long-term depletion of the groundwater resource. Now, those basins that you pointed out that are red on slide number six, this is a comparison between the perennial yield and what's committed. Um, and like I said, each basin has a different story. Some of these um, have a significant hydrologic um, supplemental source from sur surface water runoff at the terminal end of a, of a river system. Um, some of these, like in, in Southern Nevada, there's a really active groundwater management program. So although there isn't a lot of groundwater recharge naturally supplying the the basin. Um, there's there's active recharge and um, from surface water sources and uh, um, the basin is is managed well for a sustainable uh, supply. Thank you. A follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for that. That brought up even more questions, but I think I'm going to have to do a little bit more research on it for myself, my education. But when you mentioned that there are um, updates or there's working with the mining corporate, the mining companies, how often do those discussions take place? Is it a yearly discussion? Is it when there's a problem discussion? And is that part of the ongoing every three, five months discussion? Or is it very based upon both where the mine is as well as what their needs are? Thanks for the question, Assemblywoman Anderson. Again, Adam Sullivan for the record. It depends on the on the different operation and the location within the state. Uh, the, the permit terms dictate um, what those requirements will be. Uh, and often there are monitoring plans that require, it might be monthly reporting, it might be quarterly. Um, and sometimes we have quarterly meetings with the different operators. Um, and we do that in conjunction with other agencies within DCNR so that we can have um, consistent and compatible um, requirements and, and uh, cooperative relationships with those companies. Thank you so much. The permit terms uh, clarified that immensely for me. So thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Assemblywoman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to ask a question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, um, water law and water resources or lack thereof here in Nevada is a very, very complicated um, subject. And I think you were able to put it into a very brief overview in a very, very nice manner. Um, I have a question regarding um, cooperative agreements and 3M plans. Um, you went over the laws that we passed and um, in the last four sessions I've been here, there's always controversial water laws. Um, 
first in uh, time is first in line is something that we've held since we wrote our state constitution at the inception of our state. And it's always been um, a source of concern to other new or more junior members. Um, recently, and, and I'm wondering the status, I know um, you probably have limited on what you can share with us on this, but um, the status of the Diamond Valley uh, lawsuit that's in front of our Supreme Court uh, it's been my impression that um, until that court, um, that court challenge or that lawsuit was settled, the um, our state water engineer was somewhat hesitant about putting forward any more plans, uh, as there was a, a fight over what we had already passed and we needed some clarity, clarity in the language on 3M plans. Could you give me an update on that? Yes, thanks for the question, Assemblywoman Titus. This is Adam Sullivan for the record. So in, in Diamond Valley, um, this is the only basin within the state of Nevada that has been designated as a critical management area. And the requirement for a critical management area is that within 10 years, the local community needs to develop a groundwater management plan that is approved by the state engineer. Um, and if that doesn't occur, then the state engineer is required to regulate by priority for that basin. So in Diamond Valley, the groundwater management plan was developed and approved by the state engineer. It was appealed. It was overturned by the district court, and it was then appealed to the Supreme Court. And we, at this time, are waiting for the Supreme Court to schedule oral argument. So in the in the while we wait, the community of Diamond Valley has taken a number of measures to implement their groundwater management plan, but it hasn't, um, because of its legal status, it's not, not enforceable by our office. So what we are doing is we have a, uh, a staff member in Eureka that has done a, a lot of work to help people um, update their, their water right records to install meters on their irrigation wells and to report data through our website and um, keep really good records. Because no matter what happens with the groundwater management plan, whether it's up upheld or it, whether it needs to go back and be revised uh, or any other outcome, the um, continued collection of really good water use data out in Diamond Valley is gonna be essential for the, the um, long-term sustainability of that of the irrigation community out there. Great, right, thank um, you. Go ahead. I just wanted to follow up. We, you started the question with 3M plans, and that's somewhat of a different issue. That's, um, it, or did you mean to say groundwater management plans when you asked that? Correct, the mitigation and the management plans. Of, I understand that's what originally, several members of the Diamond Valley branches have reached out to me with concerns over that. And I was just concerned about um, on, on a broad sense of any of your bills that you bring forward, not just the ones today, but any that you have planned, will any of them be affected by the outcome of the Supreme Court decision? Um, thank you for that follow-up question, Assemblywoman Titus. Adam Sullivan, for the record, no, nothing that we are bringing forward in this in this session would ha would have an, um, would be related to that. Right. It's, it's my thank you for that. It's my understanding we may need to bring some more stuff forward, depending on what that is, some clarity in our language. Um, and so that was my understanding. I just wanted to make sure that we had on record that that nothing that we are talking about that you're bringing forward the session is affected by anything that comes out with a Supreme Court decision. So I appreciate that that clarity. And thank you, um, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to ask a question. Thank you for that question. Uh, next, we'll go on to Assemblywoman Cohen. Chair, um, and thank you for the presentation, Mr. Sullivan. Um, I, my question is about judicial review. Um, I guess I was I was just kind of very struck by by your slide where you referenced um, uh, the judiciary and and maybe putting sympathy above um, for for junior holders. Um, above what the law actually is, but that just kind of got me thinking about um, your office's um, 
involvement in lawsuits. And so can, can you just, I, I don't expect you to have this information, but it would be off the top of your head, but it would, would it be possible for us to get the information on how often there are appeals? Well, how often there are cases and then how often those cases end up being appealed? Yes, thanks, Assemblywoman Cohen. Adam Sullivan, for the record, absolutely, we can provide that information to you. And I don't, I don't have that off the top of my head, right. but I'd be happy to discuss that with you further and, and provide some statistics. Okay, thank you. I'd appreciate that. All right, thank you, Assemblywoman Cohen. Uh, given the topics of today's bills, uh, I think it is at least safe to say that Litigation in this area is not uncommon. Uh, with that, we'll go to Assemblyman Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, one of the things that was coming up that, that brought up is uh, mining and dewatering. And if you look across the whole state of Nevada, uh, most of the places like Vegas and in mining is into conservation and, and what they can do to put the water back into the aquifer or to refine the water. So um, it's not like they're just throwing water out, dewatering and, and just throw it out on the ground and let it evaporate. Is that correct? That's my first question. Then the second question that I've got is right now we're doing a lot of, uh, we're doing some cloud seeding, but I don't think we're doing enough to to really put more snow back onto these mountains could you address that and how much how much does the uh um, cloud seeding even put water back onto these areas like uh, ruby mountains and some of these thank you thanks for the question assemblyman ellison adam sullivan for the record to your, to your first question about mine dewatering, you are correct. Um, dumping water out on the ground to, to evaporate is a waste of water, which is, which is illegal. Um, second question regarding cloud seeding. There, there has been a um, um, intermittent cloud seeding program that's been run through Desert Research Institute and other entities since the 1960s. It has continually been in a state of, of investigation and research. Um, I can't directly speak to the efforts that are happening around, around the state right now um, or to what extent that that adds to the snowpack. Um, one, one thing that I think is worth mentioning that I always like to remind people that the amount, the volume of water that is added to the snowpack is, is, is one thing, but the amount of that water that actually ends up running off in streams or in rivers or infiltrates into the ground and becomes groundwater recharge is a small fraction of the total amount of water that falls as snow. And that's just an important consideration when, when evaluating um, the benefits of cloud seeding. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Mr. Ellison. Yeah, there's got to be some kind of amount, how much snow and how much water's uh, into the snow uh, that comes into the cloud seeding, if it's financially beneficial or not. So I think that's something we need to know because that goes back into the aquifer. Snow freezes, come down through, uh, some does the runoff and some goes back into the aquifer. So I think that's something we really need to know and not dismiss it because I think that's important. And then the other thing is, is uh, uh, the misconception of the dewatering goes out and goes into a lake and then dries out and, and, and that's not true. They've got probably some of the most sophisticated systems in the world out at these mining plants of how much they put back in and what it goes into the aquifer. So I just want to get that on the record because uh, there's a lot of misconception out there that they they just pour it out and it goes down the river and that's not true. 
they do a lot of research and, and they put millions and millions of dollars back into the aquifer and uh, where this water goes to. So it's, there's not a waste. They've even reduced the hay fields out there as far as the pivots and uh, use that for calculations. So I just want everybody to know that uh, the mining is probably one of the best companies in the world to uh, actually go back and look. They don't even get into the pit mine, the pit. Uh, systems. So, uh, but I would like to know about the snow packs and, and if the cloud seeding is beneficial or and how much it is and, and the cost per, per areas. Cause there's only three areas. I think they do cloud seeding Charleston, uh, rubies, and then the Sierras. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ellison. Um, I, I know that there has been a state cloud seeding program in the past, and uh, we'll see where we can get some additional information about where that's at. I know the budget constraints have always been an issue with that uh, program as well. Uh, are there any questions from other members on the committee? All right, uh, hearing none, I do have a couple of, I hope very brief, uh, questions just to get some in additional information out to our, our members. Mr. Sullivan, could you, uh, you, we've already touched on the issues in Diamond Valley. Could you very briefly uh, give an overview of uh, the Pahrump Valley and the most recent court decision there? Yes, thank you, Chairman Watts. Adam Sullivan for the record. So the recent decision that was issued last Thursday by the Nevada Supreme Court um, upheld State Engineer Order 1293A. And the substance of that order was, well, let me back up. Uh, Pahrump Basin is a highly over-appropriated basin. Um, and it has been over-appropriated since the 1940s, long before or before there was even an estimate of the perennial yield. So it's nothing new. Um, but the water supply in Pahrump is largely provided by domestic wells. And there are a number of, a, a large number of, of existing lots that don't have a well on them. Um, and so there is a concern from, from the water budget standpoint of the ability for the natural water budget to support the water supply for all those undeveloped lots. And state engineers order 1293A um, made the requirement that an, uh, an, in order to develop a domestic well, an owner needed to acquire and relinquish two acre feet of water. Um, and that was challenged, overturned at the district level. And then the Supreme Court reversed the district court's decision and upheld Order of 1293A. So that is, is a significant precedent. And like I said in the presentation, provides um, important guidance for the, the um, protections for domestic wells and uh, balancing that with um, limited water supply at the basin scale. Thank you for that, that quick overview. I, I really appreciate it. One other thing um, that I wanted to make sure to highlight, you mentioned it briefly in your presentation, of course, were interbasin transfers and the need for any such transfer to be uh, determined to be environmentally sound. You had also mentioned um, public trust, but um, I, I just wanted to go back to that briefly and um, see if you could just uh, speak on that again very briefly about the higher standard uh, under our state law that is in place for any uh, proposed interbasin groundwater transfer. Um, and usually for any uh, such large proposal, they tend to be uh, engaged in protracted litigation of any decisions. Is, would, would that be a, a fair characterization? Yes, Chair Watts, Adam Sullivan for the record. I. I think that is a fair characterization. Um, Interbasin transfers of groundwater where the water is pumped within one basin and then used somewhere else 
um, require a higher standard to be approved through our office. Um, one measure is that the, the project needs to be determined to be environmentally sound. There are other requirements um, such as the requirement to, that the basin of origin still has um, sufficient water to, um, for future development, um, that, the, that, the, that the destination basin um, needs to be determined if um, a plan of, of conservation is advisable. Um, and so th these are additional standards in, in um, NRS 533370 that apply just to interbasin transfers. And um, otherwise, the, the, the requirements to um, publish the, uh, the applications to allow for anybody to protest those, um, the ability to hold a hearing, those, those standards still apply to a project of that nature. Thank you for that uh, additional context. I think that, uh, again, um, one of the most often discussed uh, uh, transfers is uh, no longer being pursued, but I want to make sure that some of that context is available, especially to our newer members, um, as those are issues that, that come up from time to time and uh, do uh, come into the uh, legislative and policy arena as well. So uh, seeing no other questions, uh, we will go ahead and move on. I will uh, open up the hearing on Assembly Bill number six. And Mr. Sullivan, whenever you're ready, you can uh, proceed with presenting Assembly Bill number six. Good afternoon, Chairman Watts and members of the committee. My name is Adam Sullivan I'm, and I'm the acting Nevada State Engineer, which serves as the administrator of the Nevada Division of Water Resources. I appreciate the opportunity to introduce and support Assembly Bill 6. Assembly Bill 6 is a housekeeping measure intended to resolve ambiguity relating to whether or not the state engineer is required to hold a hearing on protested temporary change applications to appropriate water. NRS 533-345 allows for the issuance of a temporary change of a water rights point of diversion, place of use, or manner of use, limited to a time period not to exceed one year. The state engineer has discretion to publish a temporary water right application if the application is believed to implicate the public interest. And just as with a permanent water right application, a temporary application may be protested. However, NRS 533-345 sub 3 is ambiguous as to whether or not the state engineer is required to hold a hearing on a protested temporary change application. The state engineer has discretion to hold a hearing on a protested permanent water right application. And the review of the legislative history or NRS 533-345 indicates that it was intended for the state engineer to also have the same discretion to hold hearings on protested one-year temporary water right change applications. When the law was drafted, the omission of a comma has led to ambiguity regarding whether a hearing is discretionary or required. In order to make sure the law correctly reflects the original intention to allow the state engineer discretion to hold a hearing, section one of the bill adds the following sentence. The state engineer may hold a hearing on the application before rendering a decision. This amendment resolves the ambiguity and makes it clear that a hearing on a temporary application is discretionary. At this time, I'm happy to take any questions from the members of the committee. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, we'll go on to questions from members. I believe we'll start with Mr. Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Oh, I, do, I do have a question. And 
when I read through the bill, when I got down to line 10 to 15, actually 16, and where it says and hold the uh, a hearing that's, you know, they've been taken out. But uh, my question is, is uh, who makes a final decision if this is a hearing or will they get a chance to have a hearing? Could you answer that? I need clarification on that is, and I don't know if I get clear enough, but uh, if you have a for, uh, uh, somebody does a protest, uh, where does it go from there? Thanks for that question, Assemblyman Ellison. Adam Sullivan, for the record. Yes, a protestant, um, if a protestant is, is a protest is filed, is the decision of whether or not to hold a hearing is at the discretion of the state engineer upon a determination of whether that one year temporary use of water may be um, in conflict with the public interest or would conflict with um, existing rights. So that is that is a determination at the discretion of the, of the state engineer. So it's, it's important to notice that this is a one year temporary change applications and, and the the intent of that is to provide a, a short term um, supply of water for a, a, a temporary use. So that goes into the consideration of whether or not the will hearing and reviewing the substance of the protest and the, and the content of the application. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Mr. Allison. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate the, the second question. My biggest concern about this is says uh, the protests change, uh, uh, you know, for the application and the concern is if you look on line 12, it, it still has in there shall give notice to the applicant. So you're notifying that you're posting it. But my problem is may, uh, shouldn't there be some kind of clarification in here uh, uh, that says if the state engineer sees that, that, that there needs to be a hearing that it shall, uh, I don't know, there's just not enough clarification in that one part that actually could be leaving out uh, people filing for that application. I don't know, but it, it seemed like there need to be some clarification into that last part of the sentence. Thank you. Allison, uh, with that, we will go to Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair. Um, and Mr. Um, Sullivan, my question is about the hearings themselves. Can you give us some um, background about uh, what it takes to have these hearings? Um, how many are requested to be had per year, that type of thing, so we get more of an idea of how this affects the department. Uh, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Cohen. Um, so in, the, in these cases of, of protested temporary um, change applications, the division has always interpreted and implemented this the same way that um, we approach um, determining whether or not a hearing is required for, for any protested application or any application for that matter that is interpreted to potentially conflict with the public interest. Um, the hearings are are um, are held typically here in our Carson City office um, and they are administrative hearings run by our, our hearing officer um, and we um, provide opportunities for the applicants and the protestants to, to discuss their points of view. Um, before making a determination. Um, the number of hearings that we hold varies from, from year to year. Um, and uh, just depends on the, on the, on the need um, and the demand. Um, and I suppose if, if you want some more specific statistics or numbers, I, I'd be happy to um, follow up with you and, and um, um, continue to, to discuss this. 
Thank you. I, I would appreciate that. And then if you can just uh, give us a little more information about what it entails for the office to to have these hearings. Is it? it okay. Yeah. Thank you, Assemblywoman Cohen. I'm going to invite uh, Deputy Administrator Micheline Fairbank, who's with us today, and uh, I think can provide a more complete answer to your question. Um, good afternoon, Assemblywoman Cohen. So just to provide you a little bit of specificity with regards to the administrative hearing process within the division, um, so in terms of the number of hearings we have, like um, State Engineer Sullivan's mentioned, it, it's variable. Um, we're having more hearings as we have more contentious issues, um, and we find that it's appropriate and, and necessary to develop um, a very robust administrative record uh, because we have more and more of our decisions being challenged on appeal. Um, so with respect to what the process is for administrative hearings, and that time frame is we typically at this point are now conducting on average, I would say, um, you know, one to two hearings every you know, month to two months. So it's it's probably we're averaging between status conferences and hearings um, at least monthly. And the extent of those hearings can be variable. For example, right now we're in the middle of a week long hearing um, that's started today and will be going for the entirety of the week. And we have multiple hearings that were scheduled for this month. Um, just like any you know, court docket, many of those hearings can be settled or you know, we can get to resolution prior to our office actually having to have the administrative hearing. The process of getting to the hearing really can be variable as well. So in this particular context relating to AB6, we're talking about temporary applications. So a temporary application will then get published if those statutory criteria are evaluated. And then if that temporary application is protested, um, depending on the nature of the protest and the basis for the protest, we may decide to hold a hearing. But what that does is that slows down the process because the timing in which to actually conduct a hearing is we have to go ahead and notice it. We have to make sure that it can accommodate the availability of the parties. Oftentimes there becomes attorneys involved. And then it's also dependent on our particular schedule. And so because we have um, our administrative hearing section, it consists really of an administrative hearing officer and a supervising professional engineer. And then we have some staff working on various other matters within that particular section. We really have you know, one hearing officer, one staff you know, professional engineer that are the ones that are primarily responsible for conducting hearings as well as all the other um, responsibilities of that section. So those scheduling those hearings is really balanced based upon the staff availability. Um, so just like many court heat proceedings, we go through similar processes in which have, we establish you know, a, a date, we'll have scheduling conferences, we'll have pre-hearing conferences, but because it's an administrative hearing process, it's much more informal than you would have in a, a regular judicial proceeding. Um, but because we're seeing more and more attorneys involving themselves in our administrative hearing processes, which historically were more, um, you know, where we had the uh, applicants or the water right holders or the protestants representing themselves, those hearing processes are becoming more complicated as well. Um, so, you know, so we're happy to go ahead and provide you, you know, the specific statistics with regards to the number of hearings that we're having um, and those different types of things. And if there's other questions that we can answer with regards to our processes internally, happy to do so. Thank you. And, and Chair, if I could just do a quick follow up, if we can also just um, get the information, because I think what you had said is that you're just, this is what you've always done anyway. So if we could just get also the numbers of, of how many you're not having, right? How many how many are being requested that maybe aren't being held um, versus how many you're actually holding? So with, and we're happy to do that. I think what might need a little bit of clarification is, um, are you asking with regards to how many times we're requested to hold a hearing and we're not conducting the hearing? Just so I make sure we're getting you the proper information Correct. that you're asking for. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that was Michelin Fairbank, the elected Madam Secretary. Uh, with that, uh, I believe we had a question from Mr. Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this uh, this question is going to be a little convoluted, but you guys deal in water law, so you're used to that. 
but um, what I'm reading here is if the office determines that the temporary change may not be in the public interest or may impair water rights, et cetera, that you may hold a hearing on the application. It doesn't say anything in here about um, an application being contested. And more importantly, what makes you decide what is and isn't in the public interest if there is no hearing? Thank you for the question, Assemblyman Wheeler. I'm also, again, going to invite Micheline Fairbank, Deputy Administrator, to help. Always pilot. Thank you, Assemblyman Wheeler. Micheline Fairbank, for the record. Um, so the question about what, what involves the public interest is really a variation, of, is variable based upon the application. So the unique circumstances of the location of the application, the type of the application. Um, over, over time, we have seen the public interest, um, the, what constitutes the public interest evolve over time. Um, so in terms of, we look at what the very, you know, various factors that may be relating to a particular application. So I'll use, for example, we have a particular area where we have identified that there's a limited availability of water and there's certain change applications. And because of those change applications could implicate impact or affect how that water hydrology is being, you know, the impact of water use in that particular region, we're identified that any change application in that particular area is likely to implicate the public interest. We may also look at whether or not, it, as we do our initial review of an application, we're gonna look at whether or not there may be potential impacts on existing rights. We may look at whether or not there's a potential impact on some of those non-permitted rights that um, as State Engineer Sullivan discussed during his presentation. We may look at whether or not there's um, appropriation over appropriation issues. So we look at a totality of various factors that may be related to the specific application to make a determination as to whether there may be a public interest in implicated within that temporary application. But again, you have to remember that these are temporary applications and they're intended to only be in effect for one year. And so that's another factor that we may be looking at. Is this really a temporary use, a temporary project, or is this temporary application um, an effort to go ahead and get around the permanent application process and the publishing requirements in a permanent application that then may make us consider that it might be appropriate, that that could be a public interest implication. So it's really, there's not a set criteria or one size fits all review. It's really dependent on each individual application as they're unique and to themselves. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a quick follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, quickly, Mr. Wheeler. Thank you. So what you're saying is there is no actual written criteria for public interest and you don't really take into account public comment to achieve public interest. It's just something that's through experience in your office. Well, we, I wouldn't say that there's not like we have a checklist of what constitutes the public interest. We look at the at, at case precedents. We have a significant amount of case law that established precedents with regards to public interest issues. Um, for example, we have, as was articulated in the Mineral County case, and as we, we set forth in our briefing there, is there's about 13 different criteria that can involve the public interest. So those are various factors, but we also look at the, that precedents that we've had over history and Supreme Court determinations to help us define and refine what constitutes the public interest. And that is as an ever evolving factor because what constituted the public interest 70 years ago has evolved to have different public interest implications today. So it's, it's constantly an evolving process, but we look at what the precedents, we have that kind of that criteria that's been established, but it's not like we have a specific checklist because again, each very each individual application is unique to the application, the quantity of water, the location, the basin, all these different factors that would weigh into that analysis. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. Uh, are there any other questions for the division on Assembly Bill Six? All right, 
Hearing none, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we are now going to move on to testimony on Assembly Bill 6. Uh, we will start with testimony in support of the bill. Uh, as a reminder, in order to provide a testimony on a legislative measure, you must register in advance to receive the call-in information. We ask that all callers uh, keep their comments to two minutes. Um, and with that, we will go to broadcast production services to see if we have anybody in the queue to testify in support of Assembly Bill 6. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support on Assembly Bill 6, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, it appears there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you. With that, we'll move to opposition for Assembly Bill number 6. To testify in opposition on Assembly Bill 6, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 564, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Caller with the last three digits, 564, you are unmuted and may begin. Hi, Assembly. Thank you. Um, my name is Chelsea, C-H-E-L-S-E-Y, last name Hand, H-A-N-D. Um, and I wanted to testify on behalf of Great Basin Resource Watch, which is a Reno-based nonprofit public interest organization. Um, and we are in opposition of AB6. Um, since it limits public redress of a temporary change of place of diversion, manner of use, or place of use of water already appropriated, if there's a potential in the view of Nevada state engineers that the change will not be in the public interest or may impair the water rights held by other persons. It should be noted that even a temporary change can remain in place for many years, so temporary should not be taken lightly. There exists sufficient agency discretion in NRS. Five through three, three, four, five. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. We'll go on to the next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. With that, we'll go to testimony in neutral for Assembly Bill 6. To testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 6, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. With that, I will close testimony. And uh, Mr. Sullivan, are there any closing remarks you'd like to make on Assembly Bill 6? Thank you, Chair Watts. Adam Sullivan, for the record, I have no closing comments for Assembly Bill 6. All right. Thank you. With that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 6 and open the hearing on Assembly Bill 5. Mr. Sullivan, Ms. Fairbank, whenever you are ready, you may proceed. Good afternoon, Chairman Watts and members of the committee. My name is Adam Sullivan. I'm the acting Nevada state engineer, which serves as the administrator of the Nevada Division of Water Resources. And with me is Deputy Administrator Micheline Fairbank. I appreciate the opportunity to introduce and support Assembly Bill 5. Assembly Bill 5 is intended to provide greater clarity and specificity regarding when determinations made by the Division of Water Resources are subject to being challenged through judicial review. During the interim, the division hosted several stakeholder group meetings to discuss the intent and provisions of this bill. As a result of those discussions, 
the division is proposing an amendment, which I will address later in my testament. Over the past 10 years, the division has seen an increase in litigation over non-final decisions, advisory or generalized opinions that have not resulted in a final decision. AB5 clarifies that only formal orders, rulings, or decisions that are a final determination issued in writing may be challenged through judicial review. AB5 also clarifies that an appeal of a decision of the Division of Water Resources is in the nature of a civil appeal, meaning that there is a limitation on the introduction of new evidence and testimony not otherwise brought before the state engineer at the, at the time the decision was rendered. With that, please allow me to briefly walk through the provisions of the bill. Section one, subsection one specifies that determinations subject to review must be any formal order, ruling, or decision that is a final determination issued in writing by the state engineer, acting in person or through the assistant of the state engineer or the water commissioner, which materially affects the person's interest. The intent of this section is to provide clarity that determinations subject to being challenged must be those that are final determinations that have a substantive and tangible impact on the interests of the person challenging the determination. This clarification is needed because the courts have begun to expand the scope of decisions that are subject to challenge to include non-final decisions, such as a letter that did not make any final determination regarding the ability of a water right holder to use that water right, but was a generalized perspective of what may potentially occur in the future. This is one example of a hindrance to the division's ability and willingness to have open deliberations with stakeholders prior to making a final decision. Additionally, it has been argued before the Nevada Supreme Court that if the state engineer enters into a settlement agreement, that such action constitutes a decision that is subject to judicial review. This would negate the whole intent of a settlement agreement, which is to resolve disputes outside of court. Expansions to the original intent and Nevada Supreme Court precedents relating to judicial review of administrative agency action hinders the ability of the Division of Water Resources to perform its essential and core functions. These impediments only serve to harm the public and those reliant on the timely and efficient performance of the tasks of our office. As previously mentioned, the the division's engagement with stakeholders over the interim sparked some concern with the bill as introduced. The primary concern that we heard was the phrase, was that the phrase, which materially, materially affects, could limit who could challenge a determination made by the division. Because this is not the intent of the bill, the division is proposing an amendment to delete the phrase, which materially affects, in section one, lines two and three, and restore the word affecting. It is important to emphasize that these provisions are not intended to hinder appropriate challenges to determinations of the division. The division recognizes that appropriate, appropriately exercised judicial review is an essential check and balance to the decisions made by the executive branch of government. However, it is important to limit those challenges to final determinations that have a real and substantive, not hypothetical impact on the interests of the challenging party. Secondly, section one, subsection eight, adds the word appellate to provide clarification to the intent of the law and to reflect the Nevada Supreme Court precedents that judicial review of division determinations is appellate in nature, meaning the practice in civil appellate cases applies. Again, in recent years, the division has seen district courts expand the scope of judicial review well beyond the limitations contemplated for matters that are in the nature of an appeal. Expanded scope has included the examination and testimony of witnesses during oral argument and the expansion of the record before the court that includes information and evidence not before the division when the decision was rendered. Again, this change is needed to provide clarification 
to the intended scope and nature of judicial, judicial review. Lastly, other changes throughout Section 1 are conforming changes related to determinations that are subject to judicial review. That concludes my testimony. I am happy to take any questions from the members of the committee and Michelin Fairbank, again, is also here to help answer questions from the committee. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Sullivan. We'll open it up for questions on Assembly Bill 5. I know members have questions. Who would like to go first? All right, we have Assemblywoman Brown May. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thanks so much for that great presentation on the bill. I, I This is broadcast. If you could just go to the little carrot, which is the little arrow next to the mute and unmute, and make sure that it's the correct microphone that is selected. Is that better? Oh, there it is. We can hear you now. Thank you, Assemblywoman. My apologies. Thank you. Okay, I'll go back over there. Uh, in section one, subsection one, uh, it says, um, except as otherwise provided, right, feeling aggrieved by any formal order, ruling, or decision that is a final determination issued in writing. My question is, is there a time frame um, from when an issue starts to when that formal determination is issued out of the office? Assemblywoman Brown May, so it so where we have a protested matter that we have a hearing on. Under the statute, we're we are supposed to render a decision within 240 days unless there is other extenuating circumstances in which that 240-day time period may be extended. So there is a 240-day time period period for us to render a decision on a protest after a hearing, and it's after either the last day that briefing is submitted or the transcript, there's some nuances as to that, but 240 days from the conclusion of that to in a protested hearing um, matter. With respect to other matters, whether it's an adjudication, whether it's um, a like preliminary order of determination, those are not covered under NRS 533450. And then there's also no statutory time frames in which for us to issue a decision. With regards to other decisions that may come from our office that are not related to a protested application, there are not existing statutory time frames. And this is Micheline Fairbank for the record. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question and thank you, Ms. Fairbank, for identifying yourself for the record. All right, uh, next we have Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you and, and thank you for the presentation of the bill. Um, I, I do appreciate the uh, deletion of the term materially because that was like my first thing. What, what exactly does that mean? But I do have actually two questions. The first is in light of the last bill hearing um how would this work if both of these bills were to be if i'm understanding this correctly if both bills were to be successfully signed into law then that means that a decision made from ab um, 6 would never be brought up again to a court um or am i misunderstanding that so if you could possibly clarify how these two items would work if both were successful. Thank you, Assemblywoman Anderson, Micheline Fairbank for the record. Um, so th our, our current practice wouldn't change if both of the bills were enacted. And that is under the current statute, we interpret the statute with respect to uh, 
whether or not a hearing is required on a protested temporary application within our discretion, just like we have discretion to hold a hearing on a, a change, an application, a permanent change application or a permanent application. Um, so the, the effect of AB6 would not change anything, particularly with regards to AB5. What AB5 does is once we were to render a, a decision or render a determination following that protested hearing, then that starts a time frame. So under, under the statute, there's a time frame in which to challenge that final decision, that final determination. And so that would then be triggered under NRS 533-450 to go ahead and initiate the petition for judicial review to challenge the state engineer's decision. So the two of them wouldn't change the status of the law as it exists today in terms of the practical application. Everyone would still have an opportunity to challenge that final determination. I think I understand. So thank you very much for that thorough answer. So I, I got to also be honest with you. I have problems with this bill. It, it gives the impression that um, the state engineer's decision is not open for any sort of review or a judicial um, item. And I, I have some real concerns. Um, it gives the impression again that the decisions handed down by the state engineer need to be exempt. And so I don't know if you want to reply to that or not, but I do have some, some grave concerns about that impression being given. All right, thank, thank you, you. Assembly. Would you like to respond? Um, if we may. Yes, go ahead. Um, Assembly Assemblywoman Anderson, um, you, we appreciate you expressing your concern in Michelin Fairbank for the record. Um, you know, the basis for this bill is really rooted in Supreme Court precedent. Um, so the, the idea here is, as we've expressed through um, the, the testimony, is that it's not intended to uh, prohibit anyone from challenging a final determination. The idea is that we need to be you know, challenging decisions that are actually final. Um, it's, it's stated that there's been a tendency and we've seen the, you know, we've seen district courts and the courts below starting to um, not necessarily honor the Supreme Court precedents that we have in place. And really what this legislation proposes to do is just really codify into statutory language specific Supreme Court precedents. Um, for example, you know, one of the challenges that we have recently is that we've had a, a, a letter that was a non-determinative, non-final letter that was found to have been sufficient to go ahead and sat satisfy being a final decision, even though that individual letter that was issued by the state engineer did not specifically and directly impact any individual rights. It was speculative in terms of what it, what it was forecasting or what it was saying, but there was no determinative issue before our office to to decide on and so I, like i said it was a speculative letter but that decision was sound even though the, the supreme court precedence is there to go ahead and be warranted for for continuing on in front of the courts and it was and so what the intent here is really is to take that supreme court precedence and i'm happy to go ahead and refer to the particular case but we have supreme court precedence that really says exactly what we've offered to put forth in in the bill here um and if you'll just give me one moment to go ahead and Obviously, we have a lot of Supreme Court precedents that talks about what decisions and orders are appealable decisions and orders, and also limiting the, the scope and, and the nature of a, of a record. But, um, you know, one particular case that I would like to go ahead and refer to is Howell versus State Engineer. And it's a Supreme Court case 124, Nevada, 122, and it was decided in 2008. In this case, actually, was with, was with respect to a letter that was issued by our office. And so the idea is we're not saying that even a letter couldn't be, couldn't be challenged, but it has to really be something that has finality. And what Chief Justice Hardesty wrote in, in the particular decision here was with trying to go ahead and establish what the criteria is 
for deciding whether or not a decision or determination of the state engineer is subject to judicial review. Supreme Court Hardesty wrote that accordingly, so long as the decision affects a person's interest that relate to the administration of determined rights, so meaning a, an, a, a, a water right or a, a particular interest, and is a final written determination on the issue. The aggrieved party may properly challenge it through a petition for judicial review. So really what we've tried to do is take this very language, the Supreme Court precedents, that we're seeing courts start to erode and become a little bit more, um, you know, make findings that perhaps it, that even an email correspondence that may not necessarily be a final determination. Those different types of things are becoming more likely and more are becoming more challengeable with regards to individuals wanting to find a basis to create litigation before we actually get to a final decision. And what happens is we become then mired in litigation in the process of getting to a final decision without actually getting to that final decision or that final determination. And so really what we're trying to do, is, like we said, is, is bring in and codify this precedence in a manner that is very clear, that, that courts and, and the judiciary can very plainly read in the face of the language and the plain statutory language, but then can go ahead and assure that we're doing the best interest for the state while still affording those who may not agree with our decision the opportunity to challenge it. And I, I really thank you for that detailed um, answer. I realize this is a very difficult and she was shocked messy answer as well when it comes to water rights. Um, so thank you very much for that. And I'm sure that we'll have some more questions and other conversations around this issue in the future. Thank you, Assemblywoman Anderson. I believe we had a question from Assemblywoman Black next. Um, I'm just curious, are there other offices that limit the ability for the public to file appeals? Basically, is there a presidents from another agency that you're basing this on? Assemblywoman Black, Michelle and Fairbank for the record. So again, this doesn't limit the ability for somebody to challenge a decision. It just sets the timing in which a decision can be challenged, that it's a final determination. Um, so the, the Division of Water Resources, um, our judicial review process is governed by NRS 533 450. Um, other administrative agencies are governed through the Administrative Procedures Act under Chapter 233B. The state engineer is explicitly uh, exempt from the Administrative Procedures Act, except for the adoption of our hearing regulations. So we're governed by 533 450. But again, this does not prohibit or preclude anyone from being able to challenge a decision of the office. Can I ask a second question, Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. Thank you. So in water law, obviously definitions and litigation appear to be everything. And as I'm reading the bill, um, it seems like it creates some completely do new definitions for applicants and to the pub for the public to work with. I'm concerned about the those definitions not being more clearly defined in the bill. Can you that? I guess and maybe I would ask that you clarify the question because I'm not exactly certain what language you believe is, is limiting to the applicants um, that's within the language of the, of the particular bill. As we stated, we're, uh, we're incorporating Supreme Court precedents into the determination of when or the finality of a decision being um, ripe for review by the district court. And so it doesn't necessarily impact the standing of anyone. It doesn't affect the standing of who can challenge our decision. It's just addressing the timing and the uh, ripeness of that decision for being challenged. So if, if, if you could maybe provide some clarification, I'd be happy to try to respond to your question. And yeah, I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll maybe I'll just call you offline and go through some of those things more specifically. Great, thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman Black. Uh, are there any other questions from members?
hearing none, I have a couple. Um, one, following up on uh, the Assemblywoman Black's last question and your response to it. Um, you know, I think your amendment, of course, has addressed the materially affecting language. Um, you uh, recently discussed the Supreme Court case uh, establishing the precedent for uh, a decision being final, uh, a final determination. Can you talk a little bit more about um, what your understanding of a formal uh, decision would be and what an informal decision would be? So far, I think the, the most often touched upon example has been a, a letter, uh, particularly some form of advisory letter I know a settlement agreement was also mentioned in the presentation of the bill. Um, and previously in one of your responses, you had mentioned, um, you know, preliminary decisions or uh, interim or intermediate decisions. So can you just elaborate a little bit more on what you would see as informal uh, uh, decisions uh, or, or um, communications versus formal? Thank you, Chair Watts, Michelle Fairbank for the record. Um, so with regards to what constitutes a formal or you know, it's really the finality of a decision. Um, formality is more that it's it's something more than say, you know, an email uh, from staff or you know, correspondence from staff that doesn't necessarily implicate a, you know, in a determined right of an individual. Um, that goes towards the formality. With in with respect to the finality, the finality is as you've identified, you know, multiple of those different types of issues. Is, for example, a settlement agreement is really intended to be final finality with regards to the, the litigation we're resolving. Um, with regards to certain letters that are, um, you know, providing some, you know, either speculative speculation or being advisory. Those certainly are are you know, processes as part of our offices, you know, we are, we are a public engaged, a public service agency. And so part of that is providing insight and, and instruction and advice to individuals with regards to how to move forward or, or respond to questions and to have some of those different types of processes that don't necessarily result to a finality of a decision become subject to litigation would be a significant impediment on the ability of the office to do our, our daily work. Um, with regards to, you, you raised the question regarding interim or, or those different types of orders. Um, you know, the title interim does not necessarily mean that it would not be subject to judicial re review. There are, you know, interim can have a spectrum of, you know, a spectrum of finality with regards to the type of issues that are being presented. So for example, you may have an interim order that may is issue a temporary moratorium or a temporary pause to maintain a status quo for a short period of time in order to make um, decisions with regards to water resource management in a particular locality. And so what you want to do is you want to be able to issue an order to create a pause to allow that a you know, that you have that status quo maintained that you don't create you don't make greater issues or or reduce it you know, you don't want to create more significant issues um, because people are afraid of a, a pending potential decision you want to be able to go ahead and have a, you know a pause to come to that final decision to go through administrative process to come to that final decision where we may also issue an interim order that may be. For example, we'll talk about use the 10% um, reserve bill from last session, SB 140. We issued that as, a, as an interim order. But in reality, for the purpose, for the, for the time and place right now, while it's interim, it's final for its, its um, intended purpose. It's finally determined what this, this water reserve is in those particular basins, but it's interim because we don't know ultimately what that final number may be because there's outstanding issues with regards to undecided applications, unadjudicated rights and claims. So that one, you know, is is 
even though it qualifies under an interim decision, it's really the, the process of are we at a point where there's a final determination that is kind of that bright line in the sand that says, okay, this is where we're at. This is the management process, or this is the management decision, or this is you know a decision that ultimately makes a long-term permanent implication on interests of the water right holders or the, those other interests that may be existing in that location. That is what would be subject to the decision. But if it's merely a step in the process to getting to finality, that shouldn't be subject to judicial review because we've got to be able to do the work to get to that final decision and not be fighting about the process or fighting about things that are, are really questions. Thank you for that response. Uh, it does sound like some of the debates since since uh, certain certain orders or decisions may have different impacts or levels of finality, um, some of these decisions may still end up being sent to the courts to determine what is um, what is ripe for appeal. But I, I appreciate you providing some clarification about that on the record. Uh, I thought I had another question, but it has slipped past me. And in the interest of time, I think we will. Are, are there any other questions from members? All right, hearing none, we will move on to uh, testimony on Assembly Bill number five. Thank you again for the presentation. Uh, we will move back to broadcast production services to see if we have anyone in the queue to provide testimony in support of assembly bill number five. Thank you, chair. To testify in support on assembly bill five, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you. With that, we will move on to testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill Number Five. To testify in opposition on Assembly Bill Five, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits six six two. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Kyle Rorink, K-Y-L-E-R-O-E-R-I-N-K. Chairman Watson, members of the committee, the Great Basin Water Network opposes AB5 despite the proposed amendment. This bill will erode an important check and balance mechanism from state law. Other agencies and divisions are subject to similar appeals processes via the state's Administrative Procedures Act. So we must ask, why do officials want to remove this important safety net? Right now, NRS 533-450 says any person feeling aggrieved by any decision from the state engineer has a right to appeal to a district court. This is a valuable check on the unelected officials in the division. The Great Basin Water Network knows firsthand how important it is to have the provisions of the law remain intact. In 2006, during the beginning of the regulatory proceedings for the Las Vegas pipeline fight, we were concerned that the state engineer was not properly noticing protestants as required by law. We asked the state engineer to re-notice. The state engineer issued an intermediate order that denied our request. We then used the law to appeal to the district court, and ultimately our case wound up in front of the Nevada Supreme Court. The high court ruled that the state engineer was derelict in his duty and denied Nevadans their due process rights. AB5 would have likely blocked us from seeking justice for those Nevadans. Next, current law does not require a decision to be formal, and the inclusion of the word formal would overturn the Supreme Court's decision in Howe v. Ritchie. The Nevada Supreme Court in Howe used the phrase final written determination of the issue as opposed to AB5's broader final order. AB5 will block access to justice. Lastly, the division's intent as it relates to the word appellate makes this bill even worse. And that is why we need to keep the checks and balances that NRS 533-450 provides. Right now we have 
a Supreme Court ruling and other laws. We, we need to not go forward with this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Rory. We'll go on to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 594. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Shania Marks. Uh, do I have to spell my name? Uh, I'm a member of the Ely Shoshone tribe, and I oppose AB5. I believe that AB5 will harm Native communities by limiting access to the legal system and give unelected officials more power over who can appeal their decisions in the regulatory realm. Any effort to limit a tribal's government's access to the justice system should give committee members pause. AB5 will make it harder to access the courts. Right now, we have an inclusive statute that has served Nevada well for more than a century. There is no need to change it. We should also look at history to consider what harm AB5 could do in the future. The Ely Shoshone tribe spent decades fighting the Las Vegas pipeline in regulatory and judicial proceedings. An important milestone in that case involved a non-final interim decision by the state engineer that was appealed under NRS 533.450. Ultimately, the Nevada Supreme Court ruled that the state engineer failed to uphold his duties as a public official by denying the due process rights of Nevadans when he issued that non-final interim decision in 2006. AB5 would likely have prevented the Supreme Court from making such an important ruling that brought justice to the public. We must consider what damage this bill will do in the future. This bill will not serve the interests of tribes. It will only serve the interests of unelected officials. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Marks. We'll go on to the next caller. Caller, with the last three digits, 130, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Good evening, Chairman Watson, members of the committee. My name is Christine Saunders, that's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S, -E -E and I'm the Policy Director with Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada here in opposition to AB5. AB5 is a bill that will block access to justice for Nevadans. This legislation will undermine Supreme Court rulings, introduce undefined language into law, and upend a standard of review that has served Nevada well for more than a century. NRS 533-450 is a statute that was at the heart of the Las Vegas pipeline case, of which plan members and staff played an important role in fighting. ab 5s language would have likely prevented our allies in that case from appealing a flawed interim decision by the state engineer. Fortunately, we had this statute and our coalition had our day in court. Indigenous peoples, rural communities, and the environment, and many other Nevadans are depending on you to do the right thing and oppose this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll move on to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 845. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Caller with the last three digits, 845, you are unmuted and may begin now. Caller with the last three digits, 876, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Caller with the last three digits, 922. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Hello, for the record, my name is Ainsley Archibald, 
A I N S L E E A R C H I B A L D, speaking as coordinator of the Sunrise Movement Las Vegas Hub. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. We are speaking today in opposition to AB5. We believe AB5 would limit access to the justice system and do harm to our currently very inclusive judicial review system. As climate change worsens, so will our communal relationship with water. In the decades ahead, it will become even more crucial that our institutions can handle the rising tension. This is no time to be limiting access to the justice system. We are happy to sign on to the coalition letter and fully support the concerns raised in it. We oppose AB5. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 071. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Hello, my name is Ashley Foreman, A-S-H-L-E-E-F-O-R-M-A-N. Chairman Watts and members of the committee, my name is Ashley Foreman. I am a volunteer member and co-chair of the Sierra Club's Legislative Committee. On behalf of the Sierra Club and our more than 30,000 members and supporters statewide, I'm, I'm speaking in opposition to Bill AB5. We appreciate the proposed changes put forward by the state engineer, but they do nothing to quell our overarching concerns. This bill hinders access to the justice system and hacks away at an inclusive statute that provides for checks and balances on unelected officials at the Division of Water Resources. We support the way that the law is currently worded because it provides Nevadans the opportunity to seek legal action on impactful water decisions. In the long run, AB5 will likely harm those who can least afford to fight for themselves and have the most to lose. This would foreclose on the opportunity for folks to take legal action on decisions that go beyond the short term and serve as a barricade to the justice system for rulings outside of what's proposed in Section 1. Additionally, the bill's new undefined terms will likely undermine the supposed reason for the bill by resulting in more litigation for the state. This bill limits access to the justice system and makes it harder for grassroots organizations, small businesses, tribes, and environmental advocates to protect water in the courts. Right now, Nevada has a progressive, inclusive statute that allows anyone feeling aggrieved by a bad water decision to seek judicial relief. This bill will limit the public's ability to fight against water grabs by reining in who can participate in the courts and when. Water is our state's most limited and most important resource. Its protection depends on the public's ability to participate in these decisions. The bottom line, there's no good reason for limiting someone's access to the justice system. This bill lets the state shield itself from the courts. That's bad for the environment and for our citizens. Water law is complicated, but the choice that you need to make on this bill is simple. For these reasons, we urge you to vote no on AB5. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. We'll go on to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 010, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Thank you. My name is Jake Tibbetts. That's J-A-K-E-T-I-B-B-I-T-T-S. And I'm the natural resources manager for Eureka County and speaking on behalf of Eureka County. So thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. We've provided our testimony in writing as well, <clears throat> excuse me, so we won't belabor all of that and we point the committee to that written testimony. We will just uh, support many of the things that have been said before us related to our concerns with the bill. We do wanna go on record and thank the state engineer, Division of Water Resources for um, working to bring forward the amendment to strike materially from the bill and also their efforts and outreach with stakeholders. And we're, we're uh, very grateful for that, that they've been doing. Um, I wanna note that uh, Ms. Fairbank mentioned the, the intent is to align um, and codify the state in, or excuse me, the Sup Supreme Court precedents. But um, you know, that Howell decision that was referenced, uh, Ms. Fairbank read a sentence from that, but if you read the immediate preceding sentence in that same case, it casts the final, the final determination on the issue as being a quote, informal letter. So that letter was 
explicitly designated in that case as being informal, yet it was found to be a final determination on the issue. So if it's truly the fine alignment with the Supreme Court case, this bill does not do that by bringing in the language formal. Even without AB5, parties already have a heavy lift um, to challenge decisions of the state engineer. The state engineer is always considered prima facie correct. The burden of proof falls on the party attacking the same. That is in the statute in 533-450 sub 10. Only decisions that are truly arbitrary and capricious or an otherwise abuse of discretion can be overturned. This existing legal standard is protective enough against frivolous litigation, but it also protects access and due process to those feeling aggrieved. We put a bunch in our testimony about the um, materially affected, but with that amendment, um, I won't belabor our points there. But finally, you know, we do see opportunities to clarify the appellate process through AB5. Eureka County has been at the center of many of uh, the water matters that you've heard today related to Diamond Valley and uh, case law and other things. Um, it's important that the judicial review of, of the state engineer decisions are in the nature of an appeal. And we're open to working on language to address that issue. We're also open to finding better ways to outline how parties may participate in judicial review proceedings in a streamlined way. And we remain open to work with DWR to find language that we can all live with moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Tibbetts. With that, we'll go on to the next uh, person in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 986. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Uh, hello, this is uh, John Haddock. Can you hear me? We can. Please proceed, Mr. Haddock. Thank you. John uh, Hatter, uh, J-O-H-N-H-A-D-D-E-R. I'm the director of Great Basin Resource Watch. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to comment on AB5, which we are testifying in opposition to. Great Basin Resource Watch is a Nevada-based nonprofit public interest organization. We have monitored mining and extractive industries in the Great Basin uh, since 1995. We support communities uh, protecting their air, water, land, and culture from the adverse effects of extractive industries. The availability and access to water is fundamental to life and livelihood. <clears throat> According to the Nevada NRS, water is <clears throat> water is the public and not is owned is controlled by the public and is not owned. However, access to water is controlled by the state of Nevada as a responsibility to ensure equity in access. Any decision by Nevada in allocating access to water, water rights, needs to be subject to internal agency and legal review by an aggrieved party. <clears throat> either personally or in the public interest. Given the essential nature of water, there must not be any limitation or increased restriction or impediment to legal redress. AB5 will limit access to redress by adding unnecessary and restrictive language to NRS 533.450, including terms like formal order, ruling decision, and final determination issued in writing. Will be new additions that will be likely to lead to litigation down the road because they are undefined. The average citizen is already at a disadvantage to protect their access to needed water in the face of large corporations with well-paid legal consultants to act on their interests, despite the needs of individuals and the general public. Great Basin Resource Watch has seen how mining corporations have, gained, have been gaining control over larger amounts of water in rural Nevada, making it more difficult for individual water rights holders to protect their interests. AB5 will further favor these large corporations and its ability to control access to water, whether it is an environmental group, irrigation district, rural county, or tribal government. We believe this language will make it harder to stop unnecessary and dangerous proposals. So we thank you. We urge the committee to oppose this, uh, oppose this bill as written. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Hatter. We'll go on to the next caller. We are on opposition for Assembly Bill 5. If you have recently joined the call and would like to testify in opposition, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue.
caller with the last three digits, 792. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. This is Patrick Donnelly, P-A-T-R-I-C-K-D-O-N-N-E-L-L-Y. I'm Nevada State Director with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, we are opposed to this bill and support the comments and written testimony um, submitted by Great Basin Water Network. Uh, I think their analysis is probably the, the best one. Um, I would just say, you know, look at the politics here. The, this bill shouldn't be taken in isolation. There was also the proposed AJR-1, which would have overhauled the entire uh, mechanism for um, appealing water cases, which uh, is currently going in front of the Supreme Court uh, for a proceeding there to make those decisions. But basically, you know, DWR loses in court quite a lot. And so now they're trying to change the law to make that, to change that situation. And um, if you look at the politics here, we have the environmental groups, we have water advocates, we have rural counties, uh, we even have Coyote Springs, uh, uh, the, the subdivision developers submitting a letter opposed to this bill. So the opposition is widespread and uh, I think it speaks for itself. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Donner. We'll go on to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 845. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Hi, good evening, uh, Chair Watts, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Neil Desai, N-E-A-L-D-E-S-A-I, the Senior Program Director for the National Parks Conservation Association. We are a 101-year-old nonprofit, nonpartisan organization advocating for the protection of our national parks and public lands, including the Great Basin National Park and Tule Springs National Monument. Let me get right to the point. Um, we oppose AB5, and our members do not want their voices silenced. Now, you're hearing from folks today and uh, also in submitted written comments, including ours, on the numerous problems that make this bill fundamentally flawed and unsalvageable, even with the proposed amendments discussed today. So I won't, <clears throat> won't repeat any of that. Um, instead, I, I'd like to talk about this bill in the context of the Nevada State Legis Legislature's priorities in the first year since the end of the Trump era. Now, it's well documented that the Trump administra administration spent considerable time and effort the past four years undermining the public interest by devising policies that limit access to justice, science, and facts that protect our water, our land, our public health. And so it's incredible here that you, the, the members of this esteemed Natural Resources Committee, you are being asked by the Division of Water Resources to carry on the mantle of limiting access to justice by advancing this bill. And this committee needs to ask itself if it's smart politics and smart policy to continue this legacy of the Trump administration to limit your constituents and all Nevadans access to justice on matters of water, which sustains life and culture and state treasures such as the Great Basin National Park. Now is the time to be inclusive and to help restore trust and engagement in government decision-making. Now is the time to restore the public's involvement in the management of our public lands and our waters. We urge you to reject this bill. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go on to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 247. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Hello, my name is Will Adler, W-I-L-L-A-D-L-E-R. I'm representing the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe. Pyramid Lake would like to add their voices in opposition to AB5. AB5 would cause a large disruption to the existing water law and would be a detrimental impact to the public process around water rulings in Nevada. AB5 introduces new definitions and creates new precedents in Nevada's water law that is not of the interest of the public. Additionally, Pyramid Lake feels that AB5 would open the door to more water litigation in Nevada, not less, as it, as it could add to the opportunity to have a relitigation of previously decided water issues. Pyramid Lake was not consulted during the interim 
uh, for this process, but they would love to share their opinions with the state water engineer on AB5 and other water issues this year. Uh, again, AB5 does not seem to be written uh, in, in the benefit of the, the public good in Nevada and would limit the ability to, to comment as well as set other, uh, you know, upsetting precedents and uh, definitions into the law. So, again, we are in opposition to this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go on to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 667. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and they begin now. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Fontaine, F-O-N-T-A-I-N-E, uh, Chair Watson, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, comment on uh, AB5. Uh, I'm representing the Central Nevada Regional Water Authority, which is a nine-member county unit of local government, and the Humboldt River Basin Water Authority, which is a five-member county unit of local government. And both authorities uh, have the mission to protect their water resources. Uh, I agree. Uh, we agree with uh, many of the comments that have been made today. Uh, we'll be providing a written uh, statement before the end of the, um, the time to do so. And uh, I, I do want to thank the state engineer for uh, providing the amendment. Uh, however, uh, we're still opposed and, and also acknowledge the state engineer for his uh, efforts to reach out to stakeholders and, and work through uh, this bill as well as other bills that will likely be heard this session as well. Um, I just want to mention that, uh, and it has been mentioned really, that, that this bill would affect not only local governments like the Central Nevada Regional Water Authority and the Humboldt River Basin Water Authority, but really any affected person. And so we should not be really uh, reducing the ability to, to, to challenge problematic decisions of the state engineer. And for that reason, uh, we are in opposition to AB5. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fontaine. We'll go on to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 876. Please press star six to unmute. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Good afternoon. This is Emilia Cargill, E-M-I-L-I-A-C-A-R-G-I-L-L. -L -L. I'm calling on behalf of Coyote Springs Investment in Coyote Springs, Nevada. And thank you, Chair Watts and committee members for allowing me to testify today. And I also submitted a written letter, which is a part of the record as well. Coyote Springs opposes the revisions to Nevada Revised Statute 533-450 as set forth in Assembly Bill 5. And we do appreciate the amendment. However, we still remain in opposition. Section 1 of AB 5, proposing to modify NRS 533-450, inappropriately limits a person's right to challenge an order or decision, and we believe it's inappropriate because, it, because of the diminishment of a person's rights and the result of delays and suspensions of unknown and potentially limitless time frames in a water user's ability to use or develop their water rights, meaning this could easily lead to abuses. The state engineer would only need to insert some sort of language of this is not final into an order or decision, and then the aggrieved party is prejudicially remedy-less. And we also uh, object to the inclusion of the word appeal in Section 8 of AB 5. We don't believe that that would be helpful or expedient in matters of petitions for judicial review. And that concludes my comments. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be heard. Thank you for sharing your testimony with us, Ms. Cargill. We'll move on to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 349. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin now. Thank you. For the record, my name is Doug Busselman. I'm the executive, uh, Doug, D-O-U-G, Busselman, B-U-S-S-E-L-M-A-N. I am the executive vice president of Nevada Farm Bureau. We are testifying today in opposition to AB5. We greatly appreciate the outreach that the state engineer has been engaging us in, and while AB5 has been one of the legislative proposals 
that have been included in our conversations. We just aren't at a point at this area where we are comfortable in having current law changed. Over the past several years, water right owners have needed to use the court system to stand up for themselves in protecting their rights. In a number of instances, they have been successful in defending those rights through the process that has been open to them. AB 5 seems to put limitations and restrictions on what persons can do to protect themselves and their interests. I understand some of the perspective that the state engineer's office is taking in seeking to reduce some of their legal exposure and have a shift to a more finalized action for being challenged. But we still have to maintain that the law as they are now give us more assurance that the proposal for the limited challenges are available to us. Thank you for this opportunity to share our perspective. Thank you, Mr. Busselman. Do we have any more callers in the queue in opposition of Assembly Bill 5? Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, I will very briefly note um, for members that there are uh, is a coalition letter, a letter from White Pine County, and a letter from the Confederated Tribes of the Goshoot that are all uploaded to Nellis as exhibits and were submitted in writing, in addition to written testimony from some of the callers. Is there anyone who would like to testify in neutral on Assembly Bill Number 5? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you very much for your assistance in facilitating testimony on the bill, Broadcast and Production Services. With that, uh, I'll turn it back over to the Division of Water Resources for a brief closing statement. Thank you, Chairman Watts. Um, this is Adam Sullivan for the record. I do have a brief closing statement after hearing all of the testimony. The division recognizes the importance and the value of the ability of the public to challenge decisions of the state engineer. This bill is not intended to have any effect on who could bring these challenges. The division is simply asking that challenges brought forward are to final decisions, not to steps along the way of a deliberative process. If there are more appropriate ways to accomplish this end goal, then the division is open to amendments. Thank you, Chair. Chairman Watts. Thank you very much for the closing statement, Mr. Sullivan, and uh, look forward to continuing the conversations on, on this issue moving forward. With that, I will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 5, and we'll move on to the last item on our agenda, which is public comment. Uh, we are going to ask that anybody wishing to make public comment limit their remarks to two minutes. And with that, I will turn it back over to Broadcast and Production Services to see if we have any callers wishing to provide public comment. Thank you, Chair. If you would like to join the public comment queue, please press star nine now to take your place. Chair, the public line is open and working, but it seems there are no more callers at this time. All right, thank you very much. Uh, once again, thanks to BPS for helping facilitate uh, participation in this meeting. Thank you to all of the members for their thoughtful questions and thank you to the Division of Water Resources for their presentations. Uh, with that, uh, our next meeting will be on Wednesday. March 3rd at 4 p.m. And this meeting is adjourned.